This is Flipped Mini Lecture number 30, covering the things I didn't cover in 11.1 and 11.2, which is basically a, the concept of impulse, and adding the concepts from 11.3. And then you'll be in a really good position to do problems using this conservation of momentum concept. So just so you know where we're going, the time rate of change of the total momentum in the last lecture I showed was zero. But I didn't allow for the fact that there might be external forces acting on the system. So uh, here's the generalization and I'll show you how that uh, comes about. And then I'm gonna show you that the final momentum of a system minus the initial momentum of a system is equal to the impulse, where the impulse is defined to be the integral from t initial to t final of the force, which looks an awful lot like the work, but isn't. So uh, let's show these two things. So to get you started on this, let's get back out of the situation where we have capital M particles. Let's go back to just having one particle. In other words, the system is a system of one particle if that's the entire universe, then there's nothing to act on that particle. So let's have some external forces acting on that particle. So then we can calculate dp dt. Well, dp dt is, if m is a constant for a particle, m times dv dt. And dv dt, of course, is the acceleration. And now we apply Newton's second law, and so this is equal to the sum of all the forces that are acting on the particle, which we could call F net. So dp dt is F net for one particle. Really, it's just another way of writing Newton's second law, except in terms of momenta. Okay, so now what can we do with that? Here's what you can do with that. You can imagine you're watching this system from a time t initial to another time t final. And F net might be changing over that time. So let's chop this time up into a whole lot at capital N of little times delta t sub i where i goes from 0 to n minus 1. Let's chop this up into a whole bunch of little times delta t sub i that cover that range t initial to t final. And in any one of those little time intervals, we're going to make sure that n is sufficiently large and the little time intervals are sufficiently small that f net doesn't change much over that time. OK, so now. Let's multiply both sides of this equation at time t sub i by delta t sub i. Okay, so now we have dp i dt times delta t sub i is equal to f net times delta t sub i. Now the time rate of change of p multiplied by a little bit of time is just a little change in p. So the left hand side is the amount that p changed in that little time delta t sub i. The right hand side, hmm, bit of a mess. Not really a whole lot I can do with that. Now, let's try to get the total change in p. So we have this i that's running from 0 to n minus 1. So there's capital N of these little changes. So the total change in p, which is p final minus p initial. I better write out i n i t here so you don't think that that i has anything to do with that i. p final minus p initial is equal to the sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 of all the little delta p sub i's. 
But all the little delta piece of i's we already have a formula for here. This is the sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 of f net delta t sub i. Now this is a vector equation. On the left hand side I've got the difference of two momentum vectors. On the right hand side I have a sum of a bunch of vectors. Let's, to make your life a little easier, take one of the components of this equation so you can visualize it a little better. How about I take the x component of this equation? Then this says the x component of p final minus the x component of p initial is equal to the sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 of the x component of f net times delta t sub i. Now this is starting to look like a Riemann sum. In fact, it is a Riemann sum. It's not starting to look like a Riemann sum. It is a Riemann sum. You've got f net x of t as some kind of function of time. And as always, I don't know what function of time it is, so I'll just draw some function of time. And you've got two different times, t initial, which I'm writing out as t and i, I and it, so that you don't have to uh, confuse that sub i with any other sub i's, and uh, t final. Now, t initial to t final has been chopped up into capital N little delta t sub i. So this is delta t sub 0, this is delta t sub 1, and this is delta t sub n minus 1. And so any element of this right here, like let's say the third one, okay, there's the zeroth one, there's the first one, there's the second one, there's the third one. The width of the third one is delta t sub 3, and the height of the third one is f net x at time 3. And when you sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 of this, you're basically calculating this version of the area. And of course, we're going to take the limit that n goes to infinity so that we get a more and more accurate approximation to p final minus p initial. And as we take the limit that n goes to infinity, we can start using the mathematician's notation for this, which is they call this the integral from t initial to t final of f net dt. And if you want your life easier again for a moment here, you would like to just uh, interpret this as a, a, a component equation instead of as a vector equation. This would p, p init p final x p and it x, and on the right hand side, you'd have f net sub x. So in a terms of a component equation, uh, that's how it uh, looks. Okay, now this thing on the right hand side, we have it, because it's so useful, we have a name for it. It's called the impulse. So what we've shown then is that p final for a particle minus p initial for a particle is equal to the impulse. And I should say, of course, this is the impulse calculated from t initial to t final. Now let me show you how these equations change when we have a system of capital M particles. When you have a system of capital M particles, the only thing that changes here is that instead of little p, on the left-hand side, you have big P. On the right-hand side, you'll still have F net, but F net has to be uh, interpreted a little bit differently. F net is the sum of all the external forces on all of the particles in the system. So 
then why is that? Why do we not have to worry about all the forces on, uh, say, particle 2 on particle 7 and particle 3 on particle 9? Well, because the force of particle 2 on particle 7, we saw in that previous proof, cancels the force of particle 7 on particle 2. And the force of particle 3 on particle 9 is canceled by the force of particle 9 on particle 3. So the F net that you understand on the right-hand side doesn't include any of the forces of the M particles acting on each other. It only includes all the external forces on all M of the particles. Okay, so all you have to do is kind of reinterpret what you mean by F net, and then this equation is then true. Um, and this equation is becomes the definition of the impulse. This equation becomes capital P final minus capital P initial is the total impulse which you calculate from all the external forces in the system uh, integrated from T initial to T final. So now I'm going to introduce the concepts from 11.3. In 11.3 Knight introduces two kinds of collisions. There's elastic collisions and inelastic collisions. In an elastic collision, the total kinetic energy of the particles after the collision is the same as it was before the collision. In an inelastic collision, the total kinetic energy of the particles after the collision is somewhat less. In fact, I might have two things of equal mass coming at each other and just stick. That's called a perfectly inelastic collision because what you saw here was all the kinetic energy disappeared. Now where'd it go? If, if two things come together and stick, several things happen. The molecules in both of the things uh, might get a little bit excited. So there's some thermal energy. Also, you heard the sound as they hit each other. There may be some vibrational energy that's carried away by air in this case. So one way or another, um, you can lose kinetic energy in a collision, and it certainly go. If you do, there's a ways to account for how much you lost. But uh, for now, all you need to know is that there are collisions where things come and bounce back off with the same amount of kinetic energy as they had before the collision. And there are collisions where the total amount of kinetic energy is reduced. And uh, that doesn't mean that each particle in the collision has the same kinetic energy as it had before. They can trade kinetic energy with one another and it's still being an elastic collision. But what they can't do is the total amount of energy can't decrease. And you would, if that happens, it's an inelastic collision. And that, in fact, is the main concept in 11.3. And go read more about what Knight has to say about it. In Monday's class, we'll start using these concepts to say things about specific collisions.